So hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about detecting duplicate questions in Quora. So I think all of you know Quora. I'll start with some basic stuff, then I would like to go deeper. And some of you might know that there was a competition on Kaggle uh, that ended a few weeks back. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm, I'm going to talk about, like, I'm just, I have just like a couple of points to mention in the end. That's it. But I'm not going to talk about the Kaggle competition. I'm trying like more like a generic way to do semantic matching. So let's start. <clears throat> so I'm a data scientist. I like scikit-learn and Keras and XGBoost and Python. That's in the order the recruiters ask me if you know scikit-learn, XGBoost. Then they ask me if I know Python. So that's the same order. And yeah, I don't like R on Excel. It's not like I hate them. I just don't like them. Oh no, I hate them. So now let's look at the problem I'm going to talk about today. Quora, it's a question answer website driven by the community. So users ask questions and other users uh, provide answers. So it's fun to use when you have a lot of important things to do, and you want to procrastinate. And as of March this year, Quora had 13 million questions. And I found this in one of Quora answers. So <laughs> I don't know if I can trust that. So with, with so many questions, it's obvious that there's going to be a lot of duplicates. And it's, it's, it's not a good idea to store the duplicates and ask users for, to answer those duplicate questions again. So better to cluster them and merge them. So in late January, Quora released its first uh, data set, public data set. And my face was like that. So I was, I was like oh, very excited. I wanted to play with it. So the data contained a set of duplicate and non-duplicate questions. And we can now look at the data first. Have you guys seen this data, by the way? No? Cool. So there are some duplicate questions. Uh, they have the same, me same meaning, but different words are used. So uh, what practical applications might evolve from discovery of Higgs boson, or practical benefits of discovery of Higgs boson? Why did Trump win the presidency, or how did he win the presiden presidency, presidential election? So kind of same meaning. So these, these are from the data set. And then there are uh, non-duplicate questions. So like uh, somebody is asking about how he can apply uh, in Mozilla and about a car. So they are entirely different. The second one is about Mr. Robot, but they're entirely different questions. The third one uh, is like somebody wants to start an e-commerce website and what he should do about it. And uh, the other part is which web technology is suitable to start an e-commerce website. So these are non-duplicates, some of the sample. So actual data set con consists of 400,000, more than 400,000 question pairs like these. The data that Quora extracted was very skewed. So it had a lot of positive samples, positive samples meaning a lot of duplicates, and very less negative samples. So what they did was, when you go to Quora, you can see like, you have a question, and uh, they have related questions next to them. So they added related questions as uh, non-duplicates. So uh, w the data was not skewed anymore that much. And uh, yeah, then, then we can, like, there's a lot of noise in the data. And it, they also mentioned that it's not the real distribution that you see on the Quora website, of course. Um, so this is, this is one of the snapshots of the data. So like 255,000 negative samples and uh, 149,000 positive samples. So 40% approximately positive samples. The snapshot I took, I, it was like first few were all non-duplicates, so no duplicates of C there. So I started with some, now, now we can like dig into the data. So I started with some very basic statistics like average number of characters in question one, the minimum number of characters. So we can see that maximum number of characters in question one is half of maximum number of characters in question two, almost. And average number is same. Some questions had only one character. 
I don't know why. Uh, maybe a question mark. So, yeah, I mean, these are, these are, so started with a very basic feature engineering. I think I don't need to explain this, but I'll just go through it very fast. So what is the length of question one? Similarly for question two, difference in the two lengths. Character length of question one without spaces, same for question two, number of words in both questions and the number of common words. So in um, Python, it's very easy to implement these features. If you're using pandas, it's just like one-liners for all of them. So in the end, uh, last one, what I'm doing is I'm just taking a set, split, intersection, counting the length, and that's it. So it's, it's very easy. I call this feature set one, FS1. So we'll just need it to compare in the end. Next thing that I found was fuzzy string matching. So it's also known as approximate string matching, and um, it's calculating a distance beta based on the primitive operations that you do in the strings to go to make the string same similar uh, same as the other string that you're comparing to. So the pr pr primitive operations are insertion. You're inserting a new character at a given position. Deletion. So to delete a particular character or substitution, substituting a character with another one. And it's typically used for uh, spell checking, plagiarism detection, also for DNS sequence matching and spam filtering. I plan to use these features and uh, we'll see the performance, what happens. So I was like, um, this, there is a package called Fuzzy Wuzzy. It uses Levenstein distance and these are the features that I extracted. So Q ratio stands for quick ratio, weighted ratio, then have the token set ratio, so token sort ratio, and the partials of that. So there are, there are a few more, but these are some that I plan to use. Mm. Great, then we have, yeah, the fuzzy features implemented in the same way. So you can just call from fuzz, fuzz, fuzzy fuzzy import first, and then you have all the functions, just input two strings, you get the distance calculated. Not so difficult. So the next two features that I'm going to discuss are also very basic, and but they have been uh, used in all kinds of natural language processing problems all the time, so it's mandatory to talk about them. So the fuzz, fuzzy features is FS2, feature set 2, TF-IDF. So everybody knows what TF-IDF is, so term frequency multiplied by inverse document frequency. And um, I always use these parameters this from scikit-learn, TFIDF vectorizer, and they always work. It's like magic. Um, so not for English, I mean, for, it's other language than I would use some other stop words. So the next one was SPD features. So it's also known as latent semantic analysis. And I use the scikit-learn version of SVD, truncated SVD, with 120 components. So I just use them on top of uh, um, the TF-IDF features. But I use TF-IDF and SVD features in very different ways. So there are five different ways that I thought of, I implemented them. So the first one is something like this. You have the two questions, two TF-IDF models, separate ones, and then you have a machine learning model on top of it. The second one is combining the questions first. So just concatenating the strings and the TF-IDF, then the machine learning model. <coughs> Third one is similar to the first one, TF-IDF, then SVD. I mean, there's no rocket science here. Fourth one is combining the TF-IDF vectors first, then SVD. And fifth one, combining questions first, TF-IDF and SVD. But don't try this if you don't have a lot of memory in your computer. Um, yeah. So after this, we have, we have some good, good features, like word 2 vec features. So we know that everybody knows word 2 vec are two-layer neural networks. Take input as a text corpus and returns a vector for every word in that corpus. So the words which have similar meaning, they cluster together. They're always close to each other, and uh, it has always uh, provided great insights 
and, and have been extensively used in NLP tasks these days. So I use the Virtuvec trained on Google News Corpus, 300 dimensions. Um, moving on to Virtuvec features, it's, if you want to visualize it, so every uh, word gets a position in space. So like Berlin, Paris, or France, Germany. And uh, the thing is, if you subtract Germany, the vector of Germany from Berlin and add France to it, you will get some vector which is very similar to Paris, close to Paris. So <clears throat> yeah, these were the word two vector things. Next thing I have uh, before before I go like derive features from these word two vector vectors, I want something like sentence two vector. So this is how I implemented it. I'm using Python two here. So forgive me for that. So you have, uh, <laughs> I'm using word tokenizer from NLTK, and um, then I'm removing the stop words, then I'm checking if it's, uh, all the characters are, of, are alphabets. So if it's numeric or it's just one character, then I'm removing them, then I'm creating an array of all the vectors, stacking them together, and in the end, taking the sum and normalizing it. So, um, so yesterday, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very much of an applied guy. So yesterday, I was talking to somebody, and the person was like, "I, I, I told them yeah, I'm not going to put any kind of mathematics in my slides." So yeah, there's some maths about the cosine distance. Um, but yeah, you guys know that dot product and divide by the norm of multiplica multiplication of the norms of these two vectors. So these are some of the word 2 vec features that I derived from word 2 vec vectors. Uh, similarly, Manhattan distance, also known as a city block distance, calculates the aggregated pointwise distance between the two vectors. And yeah, uh, similarly, Canberra distance, Minkowski, breaker this, that's it. Uh, yeah, the next features were word mover distance. So like, if you're looking at these two documents here, there's nothing in common. And if you just take bag of words and do a cosine similarity between them, the cosine distance is going to be 1.0. But they are very, very much similar to each other. So. What word mover distance does is it adapts the earth mover distance to space of documents so that the distance between two texts is given by the total amount of mass needed to move the words from one side to another side. So Obama is close to president, speaks and greets, they are close to each other. So we are, we are actually minimizing this function where Tij is the cost or flow matrix to move ith word to jth word, and cij is nothing but a distance between the two vectors. So if it's Obama and President, this distance. And it's subject to the constraint that the flow, the inflow should be equal to the outflow. So all the words coming from document one to document two should be the same, and document two should contain all the words from document one. So that's the only constraint that you have. So for, for, for this, I was using Jensen. Again, the same uh, Google News vectors. Two more important features that I found was were skew. So just calculating the skew of word to vec vectors for question one and question two. So it's zero for a normal distribution. And uh, if it's greater than zero, it implies that more weight is on the left of the left tail of the distribution. And the second was with kurtosis. So I, I don't even understand the maths inside that, so I'll, I'll, I just use it. I use the Fisher version <coughs> because that was default. So now you have you have all these features coming from SciPy, and uh, you have the different uh, some some distance features that I didn't discuss because of the mathematics involved, and you have the skew and curtises. So. Let's see some of the raw word to vec features on the Quora data. It looks like this. Can you guys see it? So like here on the left-hand side, we have download, website, music, etc. They are clustered together. And here we have President Trump and Hillary are together. Haha. <laughs> um, and yeah, 
India and Pakistan are also together. So good enough. So finally, to summarize the features, we have like these features that I calculated. This is a snapshot of the features that we have, the length features, common words, fuzzy features, and mm, this one is more like distance features, Q and kurtosis. And then we can go into building machine learning models. So one of the features we have already created. And uh, I went with two of my favorites, logistic regression and XGBoost. I used five-fold cross-validation, stratified splits. So a ratio of positive to negative sample is same in each split. I used accuracy as a compar comparison metric. I was also looking at precision and recall. So why I chose accuracy is because Quora Engineering in their blog, they explained that they use accuracy for this task. Also, there are some papers uh, which are using this data, and I wanted to compare to them. So that's why I was using accuracy. <clears throat> so these are some of the results here. So started in the, with the very basic features. We have accuracy of 0 0.658. And uh, yeah, it keeps on increasing as you keep on adding more and more features. So the basic features, fuzzy features, word to vec features, and raw word to vec vectors, these gave 0 0.814 accuracy um, using XGBoost. I didn't even bother to train it with logistic regression. It, it was a huge matrix, a lot of features. And here we can see like logistic regression performs better than uh, XGBoost, so only case. It's the TFID, FNSBD. So, yeah. Forty percent. So, forty percent uh, positive samples. I think I mentioned it in the beginning. Um, I'll start again. Um, forty percent positive samples. Oh, we had a good recap. And feature snapshots. Yeah, so the accuracy was 81.4% uh, using XGBoost. Did not, I didn't um, bother to do a lot of hyperparameter optimization. It was taking a lot of time anyways. So maybe we can improve the results. So to improve the accuracy, we can use some deep learning techniques. But before we start with the deep learning models, and if I show you my deep learning model, um, we can just go through some general terms that, I, um, that will come up. <coughs> so LSTMs. So there are two ways to feed a time series data into neural networks. You can either have a network for every time step you use, or you can use a windowed approach. So the Windowed approach is answered by LSTMs, long short term memories, it's a type of recurrent neural networks that learns long term dependencies. And it was invented in 1997 by Schmidt Huber and has been extensively used in NLP tasks since then. So the next thing that I used, I'll talk about it, it's one dimensional con convex. So this layer creates a convolutional kernel that is convolved with the layer input over a single temporal dimension to produce tensor of output. It's very easy to understand, so I mean to implement also. Um, where is my mouse? Yeah. Next thing is embedding layers. So like you have word counts, you want to convert them to word vectors. Yeah. I, I, I think I forgot to mention I'm using Keras for everything. Then we have time distributed dense layer. So Keras has a, a time distributed dense wrapper. And if you use that wrapper on any layer, it applies the layer to every temporal slice of the input. So I use this wrapper around uh, the dense layers in Keras, and that's why it's time distributed dense. 
So it's followed by Lambda architecture, Lambda layer, and uh, it implements the translation layer. I don't know if you guys know about the SNLI model. So it's implementing the same thing. And it's implemented in this way. So you have the embedding. I've been using an embedding matrix. I'll come back to that later. Time distributed dense. And in the original SNLI code, they are using max, I think. I'm just doing a sum because it performed better for me. Glove embeddings. So it's a count based model, which is doing dimensionality reduction on co occurrence count matrix. So you have word context matrix, word in context, and which one factorize gives you the word feature matrix. So I used the uh, common crawl pre-trained vectors, 840 billion tokens, vector size of 500, uh, 300 dimensions. Yeah, and my basis of my deep learning model was this. So the SNLI thing, so you have the premise and hypothesis and it has three classes. In my case, I have only one, uh, two classes, and it's a very small neural network. So, um, yeah, with the translation layer that I explained earlier. So let's see some of the necessary steps taken before building the model. So you have to tokenize the data first, first of all. You have to convert the text to number sequences, and I use Keras tokenizer for that. So uh, uh, keeping a limit of 200,000 words and maximum number of words to 40. And then you have to pad the sequences so that the sequences are of the same size. So next step is loading the embedding itself. It's just loading in the dictionary, no rocket science. Um, then we have to create the embedding matrix. So we have the dictionary of vectors and we have the words from the tokenizer. So just grabbing the words and getting the dictionary. Now we can finally take a look at the deep, learn, deep net model. So this is my deep net model. It's pretty simple. So I have six models in this, actually seven, and the last one is, uh, I think it's not even readable, but we'll see that, so. So it's huge. It's not small. And uh, since it's huge, we look at it part by part. So starting with the model one and model two, these are my time distributed tense layers on both of them, both the questions. So we have the embedding matrix, em embedding layer here, uh, initializing it uh, with the weights, globe vector weights and the input length is 40 as previously, and it's non-trainable. And it outputs a 300 dimension vector. And similarly for the second model. Mm, then we have the 1D CNNs. It looks something like this. Another embedding, then convolutional 1D layer, a global max pooling, dropout, dense dropout, and a batch normalization layer. Um, it's something like this, so it's very easy to implement in Keras. Then comes the LSTM layers. So the thing here is I'm not using any kind of pre-trained embeddings here. I'm learning them from scratch. And uh, then we can have, we have finally the dense layers. So all of them are 300 dimensions with uh, preview activation and dropout and batch normalization. I think there are four or five of them. Um, the total number of parameters in this network are 174 million. And I was using a Titan X to train this uh, network. So now we can, we can just go for training the network and we can wait. The training can begin. So it took around 300 seconds for every epoch. And uh, we can compare it with our previous results. So the whole model takes around 10 to 15 hours to train on Titan X. And this achieves accuracy of almost 85%, which beats XGBoost. So we can, of course, we can improve the results further. We can do some kind of data cleaning, like correcting misspellings. Uh, part of speech tagging we can do. 
so nouns were very important that I found out later on. And uh, entity recognition, also combining deep net with traditional machine learning models, doing a lot of ensembling and stuff if you want to. So this was the timeline. So Cora released the data set here. On 24th of Jan, I published this thing on 27th of February, and Kaggle started the competition on the same data set on 16th of March. And this was my frustration plot, uh, because it was not about uh, natural language processing in the end. It was more about the magic features, and they were introducing magic features one by one. So I'm not talking about Kaggle competition. Um, yeah, so to end the talk, I think I'm on time. The deep net uh, gives near state-of-the-art results, and the state-of-the-art model is by MPM. It has accuracy of 88% right now. And you can also take a look at these references that I used. And thank you very much. The code is available, so have fun. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Okay. It's on, oh, it's on now. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I didn't understand that one bit uh, when you used Kiris, you used a time-based layer uh, or something to do with time. Time distributed. Yeah. W w w there's no time tagging in this, is there? So why did you use a? I mean, I have no clue what that is, by the way. I just d didn't understand that part about the time. Similarly, as you, since you can use LSTMs, they work in the same way. So I'm just using them for NLP, so for the text data. So it has nothing to do with time no, it has nothing documents. To do. It's just call time distributed. Thanks. Did you win in Kaggle? I was 16th out of 3,000 people, so that's something. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't I win. I see a lot of effort. What does it take to win? <laughs> I don't know. Never won. <laughs> Thanks, nice presentation. I'm just curious with something. When you show the embedding layer, you set the input length to 40. So yeah. I, I, I just missed that detail. So that 40 was the, the maximum number of words that each question had, or you just cut some of the words? I just cut some of the words. And how did you do that? Just randomly, or? So, uh, I did some tests, and uh, then I came up with, so I tried 60 and 100. 40 performed much better. OK, okay yeah. just random. Yeah. Just, you know if it is cutting at the end of the sentence, beginning of the sentence randomly, or? It's cutting at the end of the sentence. At the end of the sentence, yeah. okay. Just one more thing. Did you look at uh, precision and recall by class to so know if you are, which, on which class you are missing? I did, but I don't remember. Okay. But I'll run the same thing again, and I'll put it on no, my just, GitHub. Just, yeah, just curious. Yeah. But nice work. I really, really Thanks. enjoyed it. Hi, great talk. Thanks. So um, you had quite a deep kind of last layer. So how did the performance kind of, what was the trend of the performance versus the depth? Could you like add more, uh, stack more layers mm -hmm. with this increased performance? So um, by the time I was, I was publishing this, a lot of people had already worked on it. And they told me that dropout also doesn't work. Batch normalization doesn't work. So they were just using dense layers. Mm -hmm. But for me, somehow it worked. And I kept on adding layers until like five layers. It, it, it was pretty good. Mm. And, and eventually it kind of converges, so there was no point like in adding more? So the training, training accuracy is always increasing. Mm -hmm. It should. Uh, and this validation accuracy uh, takes a plateau. Mm. Nice talk. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. I have a question. Uh, at some point, uh, I, I've tried uh, uh, something that uh, has some some similarities with uh, with this. So I, I um, for uh, inputting a, uh, for an input phrase, I, I uh, search for the most. Um, 
the closest one in uh, uh, Nietzsche's complete work. Mm -hmm. So input, uh, I don't know, I want an apple, so what uh, in within Nietzsche's work uh, is most similar to this? And uh, uh, word to vac and all these sort of things. And again, I, I was thinking about uh, extending this with uh, uh, part of speech uh, recognitions. And uh, it was uh, j just one of, of uh, the things in, in um, the slide before this, and how would you uh, use those? So, you w would you identify uh, verbs and uh, find uh, word to vac similarities in verbs, or or more uh, complex approach? So, uh, in in the competition thing, what I did was use the nouns and verbs, and then their word word to vac representations, then create features from them, add to the model. So that's what I did, but yeah, you can you can use it different ways. Okay, quick question with a big answer probably. Um, so could you go more in depth into the decision you made in the model itself? Because it's a huge model, so I'm sure you made a lot of decisions. Quick question and a short answer. Throw spaghetti in the, on the wall and see what sticks. What do you mean by that? I just tried some random models from like small layers and kept on adding more layers, see how the performance is, kept on increasing the width of the neural net. So I tried around 10, 15 models, something like that. And um, yeah, this one performed the best. And then I was also frustrated of <laughs> training. So yeah. Thank you. Thanks. You mentioned, uh, or I took from what you uh, talked about that after the first batch of models, you put lots of work into making the models a couple of percentages better. And then in the last slide, you mentioned things like um, cleaning mistakes in the data. Do you think uh, with finite time, it's better to stop at the rough model and try to get more or better data? Yeah, or sure. is it better to, uh, to model even more? Mm -hmm. So when, when I started this, I was not doing the competition thing. I was just doing it for fun and trying to make it as close to uh, the state of the art thing. So I still missed it by 3%. So that was my target. That's it. And yeah, uh, I, I didn't say that there were mistakes in cleaning, but you can, you can, maybe you can improve it by cleaning it more because there were a lot of misspellings in the data set. Uh, I just have one question. Did you have issues because you used like a pre-trained word to vec model? Did you have issues with with unknown words in I your ignored port? them. Huh? I ignored them. You ignored them. So that's why mis have correcting the misspellings is going yeah. to maybe it's going to perform okay. better. Have you like an, a ratio of unknown words? I I don't know. Okay. I just ignored them. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.